Welcome to episode 101 of the Urology Coding and Reimbursement Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Painter, with my co-host, Mark Painter. And today, we got uh, Dr. John Lynn joining us. Thank you so much, uh, John. We love your input, love having you on the, the podcast. And thank you so much for joining us. John is a, a solo practitioner in Gilbert, Arizona, and that's just uh, just uh, near Phoenix. And John, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here and be able to contribute. We are going to be talking about an exciting topic today. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, very All good. Right. And uh, just to, to just to quickly mention, uh, John runs a uh, is the the administrator of the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. So if you haven't joined, please. Send John a request, go to the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group, and uh, he can let you in and, and join the discussion there. It's very active and a lot of great information there. So, and John, best, really always and, appreciate that. And best of all, it's free. And when they say it's free, I'll take three. <laughs> I heard one, one say, if it's free, it's for me. <laughs> I like that, too. <laughs> All right, today we are tackling Modifier 25 and all things Modifier 25 and going to share some things that are going on in the market and uh, get some real world scenarios and situations from John and ask him some questions on how it's working and what he does. So uh, so let's get started. I, Mark, you want to introduce kind of what, what you're thinking that uh, we talk about today and how we do it? Sure. So um, we'll start um, overall with um, a couple of things on the on the definitional side of modifier twenty five. Um, and so modifier twenty five is the mod it's it, the modifier that is applied to E and M codes, um, and it is for a significant and separately identifiable E and M service on the same day. Um, as a service or procedure. And both the CPT AMA definition and the rules within Medicare emphasize that a separate diagnosis is not required to use the modifier 25. So I'm going to put that down as kind of the starting point um, that with everything that's out there. And you know, definitionally, um, we absolutely need to follow that definition, and we'll talk about some of those things that we're starting to see. Um, but procedurally, uh, the OIG has identified the modifier 25 as the most abused modifier in the entire uh, modifier CPT setup. Um, and Ultimately, the private payers are on a uh, a mission, <laughs> let's just say, <laughs> to make sure that Modifier 25 is being used appropriately, and their definition of appropriate isn't always appropriate. So um, we've got a couple of things happening in the marketplace right now. Um, one is many of you have received an, a letter from Cigna telling you that they are going to require your documentation when you use a modifier 25 before they pay um, that particular code uh, that's uh, that posted on their website, um, John was saying, and I have seen many copies um, in my travels around the country <laughs> as people have shown them to me um, and posted on the AMA's Practice Managers Network. So. It is out there. Um, there are a lot of folks that are doing that. And I got to say, yet another intimidation tactic that uh, I, I see as an opportunity. Yes, a little more work, but an opportunity to bury Cigna um, with some additional review documents for them. Um, and then the other thing I'm, I'm going to say, and this is a little more speculation than anything else, um, but I, I have it on. So it's it's much more than a sophisticated guess. It's a it's a pretty uh, decent speculation overall in that the, the payers are starting to use computer-assisted coding tools, um, which are um, quote-unquote AI tools that try and do word recognition 
as their first line audits going through these charts, which then turn around and flag things back to human reviewers um, to to uh, to then follow through on. And we'll see how soon it is before they take the human out of those types of things. So this is one of the one of the tools that is allowing them to be a little bit more aggressive, let's just say, on reviewing uh, claims, uh, especially when it relates to modifier 25. So I'll start with those two things um, in the process, and then we can go from there and, and tease out a little more definition and try and put some examples in, in as we go through. Yeah, so it's good. a little bit more context. Uh, obviously, this is for office evaluation and management and zero to 10 day uh, type of global or XXX, well, not, not XXX, but zero to 10 day global type uh, CPTs. Um, a little bit more history. As far back as November 2005, the Office of Inspector General, Daniel Levinson, conducted a study and where they looked at 450 E and M charts that use modifier 25. You can read the ex ex the executive summary. Finding 35 percent of claims using modifier 25 back in when they looked at the period, it was back in 2002. To uh, sorry, 2002. That's it. 450 claims calendar year 2002 using modifier 25. 35 percent of claims using modifier 25 that Medicare allowed in 2002 did not meet program requirements, resulting in $538 million in improper payments. That's 20 years ago. And as, as for as long as I've been attending PRS Network seminars, Mark has stated that this is on OIG's work plan, meaning they are looking at this very, very carefully. And, and OIG Office of Inspector General is kind of like the enforcement arm of these rules. OIG has been on the warpath or it's on their work plan for as long as I can remember. So this is definitely on the radar. It's commonly used, often misused, but when appropriately used, it should result in the, the provider, a qualified health professional, making the money that you should be making instead of being punished. And what Cigna is doing is, I don't know how that's going to work. They are going to, starting August 13th of this year, they are going to require that all practices that submit a claim electronically via modifier 25 to send additional documentation to substantiate that claim to an 800 number, 833 number every single claim. So just imagine the number of modifier 25 claims that they're going to receive. How are they going to adjudicate that? And it's great that we're going to overwhelm them with these claims, but it may result in delay in payment. And what about timely payment? So that's another thing that we can, we, we have to look at as this, as this unfolds. And if you think this is just a Cigna problem, no, wait, there is more. If, if, you, if you dig a little bit into Modifier 25 among other payers, and this is happening right now, and, and some of you may not even know that this is happening right now, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield start, starting August 1st, 2022, and I quote, we will consider e &M services appended with the Modifier 25 at 50% of our appropriate Horizon allowance if one or more procedure codes that have a global surgical period of 0, 10, or 90 are included on the same claim or on another claim for that same data service. Wow. And you think, you think that's it? No, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, effective July 18th of 2022. They're going to enhance their claims editing system to improve the overall accuracy and blah, blah, blah. They have advised the use of prepayment modifier review. This enhanced editing is going to include having, as part of the process, having a registered nurse or nurses with coding certifications to look at claim data in conjunction with patient claim history to confirm appropriate modifier use. 
Wow. <laughs> it just gets wow. better. It just gets better. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, I cannot tell you now how many offices I talk to that have gone on to 100%. We call them 100% pull, which is essentially pre-review of every claim and every claim. And a lot of it stems from trying to look at modifier 25. Um, so it's, uh, so, it's, so you're the, saying the, that these practices are being edited, that all their claims are being edited by the payer before the payer pays? A hundred percent of their claims to that payer are being pulled for charts before Ouch. they're paid. They're on prepayment review. Ouch. Wow. Yes. Now, as all this stuff kicks in, a few things to remember. One, almost every state now has a prompt pay, pay law, which only allows them 30 days to pay once you've submitted the claim. So um, you definitely want to start tracking those um, as we get into all these prepayment reviews, because um, there are penalties and interest that can be collected under most state laws. So you want to check where you are there. So. It's time to to level up on both sides, because um, if they're gonna if they're gonna play, then we've got to play. What is the uh, the monetary? Okay, so John had just pulled up uh, uh, that the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts was paying at fifty percent for modifier twenty five or the E and M service. What's what's normal? What are you seeing out there? Let's see. Well, the the standard rate was. 100%. Now, there was a proposal by CMS a couple of years ago to cut e &M codes used with modifier 25 by 50%. Um, there's really no basis for that. Now, with a global procedure, um, you know, they do have overlap in pre- and post-operative work, and they do have overlap within the surgery as an argument for the, for the reduction, and that has been tested over time. But the reality is the e &M work that's being done, um, like there's no reduction in the work value that's there. Um, and, you know, you could argue that there are a few supplies that are um, potentially overlapped with gloves and, you know, basically your cheap in-office supplies with what is included in an e &M visit isn't very much. And then, in, and then you've got a little bit of overlap administratively in that you're billing one claim instead of two and following up claims, you know, one claim instead of two. But really, that is not a significant overlap in cost between the two, which is the argument that was used to stave off the reduction from Medicare. And, you know, ultimately, um, this is where I think we'd love to see you know, it's it's time to start taking these guys to court on some of this stuff. And it is going to take probably going to court as these payers dictate these egregious rules like Horizon um, in that whole process. So, so I, I, you know, it, it, it it's a cost um, to the system. And maybe there's somebody willing to jump into that with a class action suit or something along those. Um, but, I, you know, I've, you've seen some of this stuff. Where where the people have just been afraid to close the door on those things, and and we need to we need to step that up. John, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but uh, in your practice, what percentage or how often are you using modifier twenty five? Just for perspective, for some of the listeners out there. Well, first of all, like Mark said, when you use modifier twenty five, you should not get a reduction on your E and M. That's the right way. That's the right way to do things. But payers are often playing games and trying to reduce the e &M payment by 50% or whatever. United Healthcare also tried this several years ago and they received such a backlash that they walked it, walked it back. I use Modified 25 a lot, a lot, because I understand the rules after taking all the <laughs> seminars from all of you guys over the years, I really understand what is significant and separately identifiable, not, not only conceptually significant and separately identifiable, but the, I think the hard part for a lot of qualified health professional is to show, how do you show that this is actually significant and how do you make it separately identifiable to the layman auditor? 
I, and I'm going to really, I'm just going to say it that way. They're, they're essentially laymen. They don't, a lot of them have no idea what happens in the urology office. They have no idea about the conditions that we treat. They have no idea contextually what is happening. But for the typical qualified health professional in the urology realm, there are a lot of opportunities to use Modifier 25 appropriately. When appropriately documented, you should be paid for the additional service that is this, that is significant and separately identifiable. Yeah, I'd, I totally agree. And uh, the other thing I'll add in all of this is that, you know, the, the basic concept of Modifier 25 is that it applies to e &M services provided within a global, right? Typically a zero or 10 day global on the same date, but also it can be used in the occasional circumstance with a 90 day global. Um, if you're not doing a decision for surgery on the same day, which is that modifier 57. So it's available for those circumstances. But the other case we now have to deal with is NCCI's bundling edits where they've taken a bunch of our XXX codes and bundled e &M codes with them. So now we have expanded requirements for modifier 25. We can't just say it's only with zero and 10 day globals. We also have to deal with like Blupron injections, 96402. It has an XXX, but the NCCI bundled the office visit. So now we have to use a modifier 25 with that code, the 96372. I mean, there's, and then with private payers not paying attention to Medicare rules as well, you know, we shouldn't have to use a 25 modifier with an E&M code on the same day as a Euroflow or a, or a, uh, um, a PVR, but we do. Um, so, you know, it's, th there's a bunch of different things that are out there that they've increased the reason we use modifier 25. And if you're in primary care doing preventive health care visits, um, private payers are actually making us, we're having to put modifier 25 on both the e &M code and the preventive visit code. So it's just, it's, it's, it's now become ubiquitous and they're saying it's a bad, you know, that we're using it poorly or that physicians are using it poorly across the country. And there is some validity to that. We have seen charts that, that don't actually support it. Um, but the reality is they're creating a problem by expanding the bundling list and, and forcing the use of modifier 25 when we shouldn't have to use it. <laughs> it, it so. It's it's clear as mud. It's clear <laughs> as mud how, how you were supposed to use modifier 25. But hopefully we can go into some examples in the office of how we actually use it in, in a urology setting. But if you look at the NCCI, National Correct Coding Initiative, Chapter 7, which deals with urinary male genital, female genital, maternity care, and delivery systems on page four on top. It says, the global concept does not apply to XXX procedures. And what Mark, you just said clearly, <laughs> clearly contradicts what, what the NCC gui NCCI guidelines are. So it, like that's why I say it's clear as mud. And this applies generally to Medicare. And like you said, Mark, why are some private payers requiring Modifier 25, when we are, for instance, in my world, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona requires a modifier 25 whenever I use, whenever I, I, I perform a urinalysis. Why do they require that? If I don't use a modifier 25, the UA gets denied. Same thing with, I believe, Aetna also requires a modifier 25 for a urinalysis. Private payer rules are going to differ compared to what Medicare wants. And even Medicare sometimes contradicts itself. Yeah. And, and, and how are you learning about all those rules? I'm sorry? Trial and error? A trial, well, well uh, as we yeah. said numerous times with, in, our, in our presentations, communication with your coder and biller is essential. And that's how I learned, communicating yeah. with the coder and biller. So whenever it's a Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona, I will, and, and there's a urinalysis performed on the same data service, I will apply a modifier 25 on the E&M service. Yeah. And, and I, I would have to say we're the same. I mean, in the end, you know, as we, we now, uh, bill, um, that we're as an RCM company for 90 physicians that are around the country and 
every state has its own manual to deal with private payers because every every local area and even some groups now they're they're flipping on plans so you know you don't you may not have it with um blue cross and blue shield um managed medicare but their blue cross and blue shield medicaid or their blue cross and blue shield obamacare plan or their you know their ERISA plans they may require it so it's it's definitely down to the plan level that they're that they're making some of these switches um so it is a game of trial and error um and it, and unfortunately it is a game it's a chess match across the board try and then and then push back and then john i wanted to loop back you know one of the things you were talking about as, as the lay person that's doing the coding I wanted to kind of go back into our conversation that we had with the uh, audit, the chart reviewer with United Healthcare. Um, that John and I jumped on a call to support a, a physician, a urologist, who had been denied his ENM on the same date as a vasectomy. Um, and his note, if you read through it, um, had a you know, a, a quick history of the patient, um, you know, how many kids he had, something like that. And then there was a standard blurb that he used about vasectomy and the risks related to vasectomy. Now, he did have um, a separate consent form that the patient had signed that had that roughly the same verbiage, right? Because the consent form, you have to talk about the risks and benefits. And as we were explaining to this, this coder this, th that, in fact, that is a discussion that you have before you make the decision to go to have a vasectomy. I mean, you have to talk to that patient and say, listen, this is not just a whim decision, my friend. This is permanent sterilization. These are the issues that you have to consider before you decide to have this service. Um, and he, the documentation didn't clearly say afterwards that after this discussion, he decided to proceed with the vasectomy. And so the coder was like, all you're doing is a, is a consent. This is just your consent pasted into the note that is not separate and significant, even though we explained how the visit actually works. Um, and then, of course, she went back to, yeah, you should just document time, mainly because that's easier for her. But and I mean, it just didn't make any sense. I mean, it was it was definitely a long discussion back and forth. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. So first of all, the it was actually a situation where he saw the patient and performed the vasectomy on the same day. Vasectomy being a 90 day global. It doesn't quite apply to the modifier 25, but the underlying concept is that clear documentation and also you have to keep in mind who is going to be looking at your chart. You want to document as if a high schooler is reading it. It has to be so simple, so direct, so that anybody who picks up your chart can say, yes, you carried out a discussion in this situation for undesired fertility. You carried out all the potential options regarding the, the undesired fertility. You talked about what are the ramifications, what are the implications, what are the options. And then after you had carried out that discussion, then the patient decided, okay, I wish to proceed with a vasectomy. Then the separate discussion regarding the risks, benefits, alternatives, prognosis without treatment for vasectomy. Because we have to keep in mind, looping back to modifier 25, yeah. even though this is not a, not a in this case, vasectomy this case is not, should, should have been 57. 57, right. yeah. So yeah. in this case, we're not talking about modifier 25. But even if we're dealing with, with 57, <clears throat> modifier 25, you have to keep in mind for modifier 25, the CPT procedure that you're performing includes, as Mark has mentioned numerous times before, the pre-service work, meaning making sure the patient is okay to undergo that procedure that day. Everything that you do during the procedure, the supplies, the actual performance of the procedure, 
And then afterwards, making sure the patient is okay, telling the patient what you found. That is all part of the quote-unquote global package of a modified 25 CPT event. So you, you got to keep in mind what's included and then show through documentation what is not included, what is above and beyond, what is significant and separately identifiable. I think that is the hard part for a lot of QHPs, qualified health professionals. Yeah. Then I, and, and I'll add on to that. So there's, there's two parts um, that I think everyone should, should really focus on in the documentation side in the se separate and significantly so significant and separately identifiable. Um, so one is the documentation showing that, that the, the work effort was indeed separate and it was significant. It wasn't just uh, one little extra step in the whole process of getting the patient ready. But so it's got to be some of some value uh, in as far as the work effort that was done. So that's one thing that needs to be done. And it clearly needs to be separate from, as John said, the pre-service work. How you doing? How you been in the past? You know, are you still having bleeding before we do this cystoscopy? Those types of checkup things are just necessary parts and considered bundled into the procedure. Um, so, but the other thing is, it also needs to be medically necessary. You know, everything that you charge for has to have a support or a reason for it to be done, not just money. So you want to put in to your, to your documentation that reason that you did that extra work that day. Um, so not only the effort, but the reason that you provided that effort on that same date. Both of those need to be in there. Absolutely. All right, let's give some examples. Let's yeah. dive into some of those. Okay. What do you what are you seeing? What's a common example that you're that you run into time and time again? All right. So, yeah, go, go ahead, ahead John. Mark. Go ahead, Mark. All right. <laughs> All right. One I was thinking about is um, you know, we have a lot of patients coming in for routine injections for LHRH. Um, again, an XXX global procedure, but the NCCI bundled in the EM visit with the Lupron injection, the 96402, or the Eligard, or whatever um, LHRH you're using, or even the Agonist um, for that matter. So we'd mention all of them um, and that whole process. So the, the 96402 is being done, and these, these shots are being given routinely. Um, and ultimately, when you think about those particular visits, there are a lot of times that the nurse who is, is giving those shots, and there, there's not necessarily the patient's been stable for a long time. They're getting three-month uh, doses. And every time they come into the office, is it really necessary for a physician to spend time updating their disease state? The, the answer to that is probably not um, every single time. Now, you may have individual patients that you do need to monitor uh, each time. Other patients, maybe it's every six months you want to check in on them or once a year. But you've got to look at that medical necessity that's there. And so asking that patient, you know, how's it going? Have you had any other symptoms? How'd you do with your last shot? Are you ready for uh, the next shot? Giving them the shot, that's all part of the shot, right? Telling them what's going to happen afterwards and how they're going to feel, make sure that they're ready. For, all of those things are bundled into that. But if you're dealing with extra data coming in, you're really updating their disease state. Maybe, you're, uh, maybe with these guys, you're checking their prostate or something along those lines. Those aren't necessarily part of the injection. And if those are documented, you should use the modifier 25. So again, going back to make sure that you have that reason for visiting with them that day and also providing that service and documenting what that additional service was are all things that need to be part of it. And that's a fairly common one. Or to, to piggyback on the LHRH example, so the LHRH injection has the drug component and also the injection code, 
what Mark is saying is that that injection code price or or reimbursement includes the pre-service, intra-service, and then making sure the patient tolerated the injection okay before he leaves. That is all bundled into that injection code. Anything above and beyond, for instance, the patient comes in for that LHRH injection, and then he complains that, hey, you know what? I've been noticing that my stream is getting slower. So not necessary to have a separate diagnosis, but in this case, a separate diagnosis, separate problem that you are now addressing. And if you go down the treatment path of, okay, what, what do you think is going on? Get a, get a history, do an examination, come up with an assessment and plan, then that is a modifier 25 event, provided that you do the significant and and separately identifiable documentation. Right. Yeah. Or or a PSA that's that you're so that PSA is coming in at the same visit. So you're there maybe it's at their annual they're they're a year out from their last PSA. So their their PSA is drawn. You get the PSA, it's going up a little bit. So now you spend time talking to the patient, same diagnosis, right? You're talking to the patient about the fact that their PSA is going up. And this is then, and even if you decide at that point in time, we're just going to keep an eye on this right now. Um, but um, we do want you to to let us know if there's anything else going on. We're gonna we're gonna shorten the window between your PSAs. All of that is significant and separately identifiable in that same diagnosis. So that would qualify for that ENM on the same date. But again. Got to got to write it down. You got to write down write your thinking, down. your thought process. PSA has increased in interim. This is probably what I would write down. Patient being treated with LHRH for prostate cancer, for intermediate risk prostate cancer, high risk prostate cancer, whatever it may be. Hopefully not high risk anymore, but mm -hmm. prostate cancer and the PSA is slowly rising. This may indicate disease progression instead of instead of checking a PSA every six months, I would like to check every three months and patient has been advised to inform me if there are any constitutional signs and symptoms, bone pain, blood in the urine, worsening difficulty, urinating, etc. So anybody reading that will be able to tell, okay, this is something more than just giving a Lupron LHRH injection. Perfect. All right. Yep. All right, John, how about a, how about a cysto on the same day? Oh, a lot of examples. Cystos being part and parcel of pretty much everything that we do, uh, that we do every single day, as a matter of fact. It's probably cysto, post cysto modifier 25 is probably the most common usage of modifier 25 for me. And you could have a BPH patient you saw initially, you scheduled the patient for cystoscopy. The patient then comes in for a cystoscopy and a transrectal ultrasound, which is now supported by the AUA guidelines to to obtain some sort of volumetric imaging and to perform cystoscopy. For those of you who have not been updated on BPH guidelines, please consider doing cysto and transrectal ultrasounds. It gives you so much information. So the second visit, patient, this is a scheduled cystoscopy, and the patient comes in for a cystoscopy transrectal ultrasound on the second visit. So, so perform the cystoscopy, the patient did great, and then now the patient wants to sit down and talk about, well, what are the implications, what are the treatment options, and then how are we going to treat this problem? So the work, the, making sure the patient can have the cystoscopy, make sure he doesn't have a UTI or UTI symptoms, doing the cystoscopy, whether you're using reusable scopes or disposable scopes, the supplies, the gloves, the saline, water, whatever you use, and then making sure the patient recovers from the cystoscopy that's all included in the global for that 52000 CPT. What is not included is the discussion about implications, treatment options, and then the ultimate decision to treat or not treat this condition. That Those are not included in the global package of cystoscopy. What you found during cystoscopy is part of the global, telling the patient that you saw it in large prostate. That's part of the global package for the cystoscopy. What is not included is what you, what are you going to do about it? What does it mean and what are you going to do about it? And also ultimately the decision to do or not do something, that is not part of the global. And when appropriately documented, that's a modifier 25 event. 
even though the diagnosis remains the same, BPH with obstruction. Perfect. And then, of course, your hematuria visit. A lot of those that come in with hematuria, you may even you scope them on the same date. It's same thing, right? Your pre, pre-service workup, trying to find out if there's a reason to do a cystoscopy, um, looking at the UA, um, getting the patient history, um, finding out what their potential risk factors are, and then um, deciding at that point in time you need to go you need to proceed for a cysto on that same date. Again, modifier 25, if well documented, um, that is not part of the global. You're actually working outside of the global because you're not actually working them up for a cysto. You're working them up to find out what's going on and then working to the next step in what they're trying to do, which is significant and separately identifiable. Yeah, pretty once once you figure out the general concept, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you can just think in terms of buckets, what is included in a CPT for the procedure, the global, the quote unquote global for that CPT of that zero to 10 day procedure. And then what are you doing beyond it? And most importantly, clearly documenting it. And Mark, you had alluded documenting the procedure in a separate note. Ideally, you want to, you want to document it in a separate area to make it really, really simple for the auditor to see that note to say, yes, this is the note that you did for the procedure. It's included in the global of that procedure. And then now you have a separate area where you discuss implications, treatment options, and the ultimate decision to pick a treatment option, whether that's observation, medical therapy, minimally invasive surgery in cases of BPH, or something more invasive like a TURP or a whole lap. Yeah. And John, you're, um, you've been using an EHR for several years now um, and all of that. And I'm assuming you have a template for your cystoscopy um, to kind of give you that jumping off point of what type of scope you used, what position, blah, blah, all of that that was there. And the consent, the, at least the verbal consent, if you, if not a written consent for all of that, is standard language that you would use for every patient. And then you have your findings and all of that. The my question to you is, with your EHR, does that uh, note get populated into a specific se- section within your evaluation and management note for the date, or is it actually populated separately? It's actually populated separately under so this called procedure entry rules, and I have the preoperative diagnosis, postop diagnosis who did the procedure, what type of anesthetic, what are the prosthetic findings, the length of the prosthetic urethra, et cetera, the the bladder findings, and then a description, like you said, of exactly the the brief description, the patient was considered was obtained, placed in a supine position, area was prepped and draped, an Olympus digital flexible uteroscope, a cystoscope was used, and then the patient tolerated procedure well. well, well. That's all all included in in that template but it's customized to every single patient because the findings vary depending on the patient. That is in a separate section of the EHR under procedure entry rules. And then the that procedure, that CPT is ordered in a, an encounter note. So I ordered that CPT in an encounter note, document that separately under procedure entry rules, and then I have the encounter to discuss the findings of the cystoscopy and then what we're going to do. Okay. Yeah, very good. And and I mean that one's pretty easy to separate out. And I but I do know there are some EHRs that actually put that template note into the evaluation and management note. And I still consider that significant and separately identifiable and separated because that note, even though it is located within the EM note, is a clearly separated note. But you do want to make sure that your e m that wraps around that still has everything that you went through, including the order um, for that Cisto on that date. Um, so um, that makes it, I think, you know, it, it's still doable and it's still supportable um, as we read through those notes. So... I mean, you are stuck with the constraints of whatever your E&M system gives you. Um, 
But there are some of those places where you can actually change your ENF, your EHR to actually support the separate notes. So you want to look at both of those options moving forward. Um, what's really difficult is when that note uh, that Sisto note is in there and that the the bulk of the note that follows in the assessment and plan is really about the findings and no real emphasis on the activity or the time spent um, in talking to the patient about the activity you're going to take based on those findings. Um, so those are some of the other places where we see that emphasis really needs to be focused on the appropriate development of your note. Um, but within the constraints of each of the EHRs that are out there. Yeah, I completely agree. I have seen notes from other urologists where the cystoscopy discussion is just part of the entire encounter. It's just a paragraph. You can consider doing that or continue doing that, but it's going to make it difficult for the auditor to pull that out and say that this is a significant and separately a sig significant uh, a portion of a separate ENM or separate CPT. Consider using maybe a dot phrase or auto replace text, which populates that a little bit more. So you have the pre op diagnosis, post op diagnosis, and then talk about the actual procedure being done and also the intraoperative findings. So create bulk that up a little bit, create a separate section. It's just, it, you create that template once and, and it's going to stand forever, you, just like ENM 2021 rules. You learned this once, and I tell my colleagues you're probably going to use this for the rest of your practicing careers. Learn it, learn it well, and apply it. Apply it correctly and confidently so you don't have to get take backs and, and these prepayment audits and things like that. And speaking yeah. of learning about these nuances, <clears throat> uh, Scott, would you let us know about an upcoming opportunity where urologists and coders and office managers can learn about more about e &M rules? You bet. Thanks, John. <clears throat> the uh, We have an upcoming urologist workshop on July 23rd, which is a Saturday, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And what we're going to do there, it's for urologists and staff are welcome to attend as well as admins, but it's for urologists that really want to hear these detailed discussions and understand, get a, just get a real good understanding and work through some of these uh, difficult or just basic concepts that have these nuances. So really to talk about modifier 25, all the different modifiers, the global concept, and Mark and John are gonna be presenting uh, this information and then going through scenarios and really part of the the whole experience is the discussion that goes on between uh, the the attendees and the the presenters, and just really hearing what others are asking, hearing different scenarios, and going through. It's so valuable to to getting your problems solved and and understanding that things that you may not know you don't understand or may not know that you don't know. It's it's super valuable, and you can. Go to the episode page, prsnetwork.com forward slash 101, and there's links to the workshop, and you can sign up there. And I'll also forward to you all the links, uh, the NCCI and also the Cigna web pages and stuff like that. I'll send it to you and so that you can include it in the show notes. Yep. Very and, good. I, and, and Scott, I should add that number, and it did, the, you gave the date, but it is virtual. So yes. it's oh, going to be inter that. interactive and virtual. And the other thing you forgot to mention, mid-levels, APPs. Um, they, you know, as uh, as we have seen across the country, PAs, NPs are becoming an essential, an essential and very valuable asset for urology practices around the country. And they need to understand these just as well as the physicians do. You got plenty of your APPs now that are doing cystoscopies and they're in charge of injections and the follow-up. And so um, you definitely want to make sure APPs, we are going to focus it on the clinical side. So APPs, physicians are going to be the, the primary target, but you know, your, your coders that 
that are a little more clinically skilled or, you know, want to see, maybe get a look behind the, a lot of times I see in practices, the, the billing staff is still separated from the clinical staff in not just physically, but just informationally. Um, and that's a, a, that's a huge mistake um, that we've seen um, around the country. There, there needs to be some strong integration in there. So if you're, if you're in that position and want to get a little bit more facile in discussions with your physicians about what's going on and understand, you know, basically ascend from the layperson coder to the actual, you know, urology coder, this is a good, this would be a good forum for you as well. All right. Once again, that's on July 23rd. So we'll have the links in the, the show notes. And what I love about these PRS uh, seminars is that you are so respectful of our time. The, for instance, the, the, the ones that are coming up in December and January, the urology advanced coding and reimbursement seminar, one day is Friday. And then the other day of the seminar is on Saturday. And this upcoming one in July is on Saturday. So you're not taking away from my productivity in the clinic Monday through Friday. So your, your empathy towards us is uh, greatly appreciated <laughs> over the years. <laughs> Very Thank good. Well, and, we, and... we may have had a little bit of influence there <laughs> <laughs> with Ray. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and I will mention, uh, you know, I will also say that uh, we'll put links to the Urology Advanced Coding and Reimbursement Seminar, which is coming up in December, as John mentioned, in Las Vegas, December 2nd and 3rd. And then uh, in January in New Orleans, the uh, last week uh, of January 2023. And there'll be links in the, uh, again, in the show notes. And, you know, in those, in those two seminars, we really have a lot of these discussions and we go into what are the, the new things you need to worry about or what are the trends that you need to understand to, to really make sure that your you're capturing all the services you're providing and getting paid for those services. And that applies to not only the private practicing uh, urologist, uh, but also the employed urologist and, and NPPs, APPs. And that same thing with the workshop. It, you can gain that information that you need through the, these uh, workshops and seminars. And just to reiterate what Mark said regarding the APPs, a lot of the APPs, although maybe salaried, or even even the urologists who, who work for uh, Kaiser, they think that, oh, we're salaried, they don't keep track of our productivity. Hogwash. Your productivity in terms of work RVUs are being tracked. And how are work RVUs calculated? The use of these CPTs, the use of these ENM codes. So you need to master these and maximize your productivity so you can justify hey, I need a raise because I am increasing productivity. I'm bringing in revenue to the practice. I'm taking care of these patients really well without learning these rules and understanding them. And just like the tax code, you're doing, you're, I'll be blunt, as I always am, you're exploiting these rules to your advantage. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like the tax code. These are the rules. You're just applying them to your advantage. That's it. So learn the rules and it's going to be beneficial. Now, let's talk about some free resources. The Facebook group, the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group is free, where we talk about a lot of practice management issues, etc. In addition, PRS has a free free resource as well, right, Scott? Where we can talk about coding and billing? Yes. Yeah, so if you uh, well, associated with this podcast is the Urology Coding and Reimbursement group, where you can ask questions. And also, we have monthly webinars, which, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, every month we'll uh, cover different topics that are going on. And we really want to encourage everybody to join our free monthly webinars. And uh, we, we cover like the, this one upcoming. And a matter of fact, it's, it's happening today as we record this, but it's, uh, it's on documentation and audits. So well, we do encourage like you to do that again. Then. The, you can reach, get all these things will be linked in the show. So if you go to the show notes at prsnetwork.com forward slash 101. And I want to circle back really quickly to, to modifier 25 and, <laughs> and, the, and, and tie it back a little bit to John's discussion about work RVUs. 
you know, I, I did a study um, when we were trying to to vet out really how and what a physician should understand relative to coding. Because it, I mean, it is an effort to to make sure you understand CPT coding and how the documentation um, ties back to that. Um, 55% of the average physician work RVUs was generated by E&M codes. And, and, I, and when we looked at this, the, the number of E&M codes that required a modifier 25 to be supported um, was in that 35 to 40% range. So you are talking about a significant of production. So if you if you're not facile with modifier 25 or if you've got a coding and billing department that doesn't understand when modifier 25 is appropriate, that could cost you roughly a quarter of your work RVUs. So that's a that's a big chunk when you're looking at the productivity piece. Um, if you're contracted and from a revenue piece, you know you're talking about an average of somewhere you know in that in that hundred dollars per encounter. If you kind of bl blend all that stuff together, that's a big revenue chunk when you consider how many office visits you or how many encounters you deal with every week. So it's a big it's a big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, it's a big chunk of change. And to uh, end this, hopefully, I think we're ending this. I, I, knew, this was, I knew this was going to this is going to run long, and I, I know we can go longer. Uh, yeah. But I just just to bring it back, the 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 risk of not understanding and the risk of misapplying these modifiers, for instance, a modifier twenty five, just in urology specifically, you don't need to look anywhere further than the. Department of Justice, DOJ, and look on February 25th of 2019. It specifically cites a urology practice in Southern California that had to pay $1.85 million to settle a False Claims Act allegations of Medicare overbilling, specifically using the modifier 25. Not only that, money, okay, great, you paid the money, it's a big group, but now you have to, that practice now has to be entered into a corporate integrity agreement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Now, imagine having DHS crawling up your behind to audit your charts going forward. That's a pain in the butt. So an <laughs> ounce of prevention is definitely worth it. Learn these rules. I can't emphasize this enough. And uh, <laughs> take a course learn the rules. It's going to make your life so much easier. Yes. Yes, indeed. Very good. All right. So let's uh, wrap this up here. John, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for sharing uh, all, all the great information. We really appreciate it. And uh, let's get some final thoughts and then we'll, we'll sign off. Uh, Mark, final thoughts. So audits are and chart reviews are a part of your daily life. That's just a fact, the way things are right now. So, you know, I, I, I still get the question as I travel around, can I code so that I don't get an audit? The answer to that question is a hard no. There is no way to code that you won't have your charts reviewed. It's just not there. Your charts are going to get reviewed pre-service, post-service. Cigna's going to look at them. I mean, United's going to look at them. They're going to lose them. So <laughs> you've got to have um, you've got to have good documentation to start, and you've got to have a good team backing you up to make sure that the games these players play are are, are you're well defended against, so that you can actually play better than they do. So. Um, but it all starts with documentation. If I don't have the documentation, I can't support you. Um, so um, as a clinician, if you want to get paid and paid accurately, spend the time to learn the rules and, and build your documentation to support the work that you've performed that's medically necessary. Well said. John, final thoughts? I want to thank whoever emailed me or 
DM me regarding the ENM25. This is kind of the impetus of this uh, this podcast. Uh, she asked, "Would you share your verbiage for getting ENM with modifier 25 paid on same day as in office is still procedures, or is it different every time?" So hopefully, we answer that in this podcast. And lastly, I just want to thank everyone for the privilege of your time. Remember to take care of yourself and to take care of each other. All right. All right, that's it. We'll wrap it up here. Take us out, John. Happy coding. <laughs>